have on David Pendleton. He's a comic ventriloquist. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great. Doing great. Fantastic. So uh, could you go ahead and kind of give us an introduction on how uh, you uh, found Vent or how Vent found you? You know, I started uh, doing ventriloquism when I was about six years old. I had uh, the Jimmy Nelson instant ventriloquism album that my grandmother gave me. Um, the very first, well, my very first exposure to uh, ventriloquism, I was at a friend's house. And of course, I barely remember this. I think I was like mm -hmm. five years old. Uh, but he had a Danny O'Day uh, dummy, you know, toy figure, and sure. the kind with the string in the back of the neck. And I was totally intrigued by that. There was just something about it that just cap captivated me. Mm -hmm. So I played with that, and um, then I asked for one of those for Christmas or my birthday, and it was my grandmother that gave me actually a Charlie oh. McCarthy uh, oh. puppet. Uh, same thing, you know, the Juro puppet with the string yeah. in the neck. Uh, when on my sixth birthday, and so uh, she also found the Jimmy Nelson album. And I started listening to that album and, of course, was also very intrigued by ventriloquists that came up on television and, um, you know, people would point out to me as a youngster, sure. uh, you know, who the ventriloquists were. I learned about Edgar Berg and, of course, and Paul Winchell and those guys. Mm. So I started very young and, and um, nobody thought that I would keep it up. But <laughs> I think that I kept doing. Mm -hmm. What what made you uh, pursue it? Well, I memorized the script that came with the record album, mm -hmm. and uh, I did a little talent show for Cub Scouts that I was in, involved in, mm -hmm. and there were just a lot of people that gave kudos and accolades after that talent show and i just thought oh this is something that i that i might be kind of good at that's fantastic so what what age were you in that were you a teenager or were you younger? Yeah, I, was, I was eight years old I was oh eight, wow okay eight, that's eight. awesome <laughs> that was my wow. probably my very first performance on stage in that talent show when i was eight and i just did the script that came with the record album verbatim because uh, I knew nothing about writing or, uh, you know, creating a show or anything like that. So that, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm taking I'm also taking questions from uh, that we get from Facebook. We have one question right here from uh, Dan Satchoff saying any truth to the rumor that Tilly has COVID? <laughs> well, I we have been practicing social distancing, so uh, she is not letting me come near her uh, and she is in the high risk category. Um, she hasn't been tested, but uh, she has been talking to me about possibly injecting herself with Lysol just to make sure. That, yeah. <laughs> well, you have an animatronic puppet, which is great for the whole six feet away thing. Yeah, that is true. That would yeah. work. And I thought about pulling him out. Yeah, I'd have to kind of put him together and get all yeah. the, the radio for this, but I didn't. Could you could you talk about him? Because he's a, a beautiful work of art and 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 uh, mechanics kind of put together. Yeah, I, I came to Ray Gwill years ago and uh, gave him the vision for this puppet. And uh, Ray was the one that did the original sculpt Okay. and worked on him. And this was the very last figure that Ray actually built. Um, wow. And actually he, he didn't complete it. Um, it was still in process. Uh, Ray was kind of known for taking his time on projects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but Austin Phillips and I actually went to Ray's bedside um, the very weekend, actually, that he passed. Wow. And um, Ray called Barbara, his wife, over and kind of took all the pieces and parts that he had made so far mm -hmm. uh, of this puppet, uh, Sergeant Major Boo yeah. And uh, we just kind of had him on his chest. You know, Barbara kind of brought the pieces and he was, he was in a hospital bed in yeah. his uh, in his home in his living room, and um, so Ray called over 
Austin and then basically handed him the pieces and said, Austin, I want you to finish this. That you need to finish this for David. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was a really, really uh, profound moment. And, uh, you know, all of us were just weeping, you know, when that happened. So mm -hmm. Austin uh, took Bura and completed him. And he and I worked together. Uh, Austin had never done anything with um, servos and that sort of thing. And I spent several years trying to come up with a design that would work. The challenge mm -hmm. with a figure like that when you're using servos, because a servo just controls one axis, you know, it's sure. just a little thing that does this. And so we had to come up with a three axis movement uh, for the head so that the head could not only nod and move like this, but then of course also turn. So those are the three axes. So we and I, yeah, go I ahead. love that attention to detail too, because most on most animatronic puppets that you see, uh, it looks like something from Chuck E. Cheese where it all moves in one direction. Yeah. And so I love that you guys put that attention to detail into um, copying that that movement that is natural in, in aspects of puppetry. Well, I wanted him certainly to look lifelike, and it is true. Sure. The simplest thing that, you know, people, of course, go with simplicity, and I understand that when they're trying to create something that they can control. Sure. Remotely. And the simplest thing, of course, is to just have one servo that, you know, makes the head turn. But mm -hmm. that's what it ends up looking like, is this very mechanical, you know, <laughs> one-axis movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and I came up with the design to also incorporate this, but realize that unless you have this going on, mm -hmm. uh, there you really don't get the realism that you want. So yeah, that took some time to design that. And then of course the other movements are pretty straightforward. You know, the mouth is just a single servo, and the eyes and that sort of thing. So where did the idea for the, like the sergeant character come from? Well. <sighs> I was doing a writing session with a friend of mine, uh, Robert G. Lee, who's a really incredibly talented comedy writer. And we were exploring different character ideas. And really it was Robert that kind of came up with the character initially as he was basically interviewing me, you know, the, just yeah. talking to me about, you know, what are the things that you're passionate about and sort of sure. thing. And, um, I, I think I thought it would be really cool if we had a character that was a little bit more offbeat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the concept behind him is that he would make snide comments from, you know, off to the side. And mm -hmm. so I would be doing my regular act and he would be, you know, making these insults and snide comments along the way. So, and that is still very much in process. I've used him on stage uh, and it's gotten good response, but I still really need to hone the material, which as you well know, Landon, is uh, the biggest sure. challenge with what we do, so. Yes, definitely. Well, it's the, I, I had seen a video somewhere of, of you performing with Tilly and, and the sergeant in the back. And it's it's a great, it's it's neat, because it you look at the sergeant and then, but you forget that he's there and then, because you're focused on you and whatever character you have out and then the, he makes a quip and it's it's really great. So uh, kudos on that idea because that's definitely a, a, a different thing that I've I've seen done in this in this aspect of ventriloquial performance. Um looking back at some of our comments we have from our Facebook Live, Dale Brown commented, What has the event convention meant to you? And then Dan Satchoff uh commented, What has Dale Brown meant to you? So I guess <laughs> you can put those in the same. Well, actually those two things are very related. Dale Brown yes. was one of the first people that I met as a 13 year old at the ventriloquist convention. Wow. And, and he pulled me aside and just, you know, got to know me, asked me questions about my life and, you know, how did I get interested in ventriloquism? Mm -hmm. And I had uh, purchased uh, a Craig Lovick figure and he actually had a Craig Lovick figure that he was using at that time. Oh, wow. We kind of compared notes, and it was just so fun for me to meet somebody. And this was a, you know, somebody older than me that uh, really just kind of took me under his wing. And yeah. uh, that was delightful for me to um, meet people like Dale that really took an interest in, you know, the young kids like me. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, gave advice. And I believe at that time, Dale was just starting to go pro. Like he had been doing ventriloquism. He had put together an act and he had been using it uh, to do parties and, you know, the things that people will do when you're just getting sure. started. Uh, but I think that that was the era or just about within that era that um, mm -hmm. Dale was making that choice to like, you know, quit the day wow. job and completely go pro. I'm going to go full time, yeah. which was a big step. So mm -hmm. I got to listen in. I listened in on uh, his conversations with other older ventriloquists about that process. And yeah. uh, it was just cool that that was, that's what made the ventriloquist convention so meaningful for me is just being included in the gang, yeah. you know, in the community. So, yeah, definitely. I, I remember my first convention, everyone's, it really is a family. Everyone's so uh, welcoming and, um, you know, you see the professionals helping the, the, uh, the newcomers and the junior mic contests and everything. And, and uh, Dale Brown and Bob Isaacson and, and all those all those figures um, in the event community were very helpful yeah. and um, very welcoming. Um, we have another question here. Uh, it's uh, Michael Dawkin uh, commented, David, at what age did you decide to focus on uh, gospel ventriloquism? So I was in college when basically I, as we would say, when I gave my life to Christ and um, Really, I made that decision in high school, but it was not something that really took until I got to college. I got involved in a Bible study with Campus Crusade for Christ and started just um, spending time with other believers and uh, really started to get uh, more serious about my faith. And uh, Campus Crusade for Christ is uh, an organization that exists on college campuses all over the country. Really strong emphasis on you know, sharing your faith, talking to people about what it means to know God personally through uh, faith in Christ. And I was doing ventriloquism at that time. I um, had been doing it all through high school and, you know, the typical birthday parties and uh, various, you know, banquets and events that mm -hmm. that are opportunities when you're at that age. Sure. Uh, and so I just had a group of friends that kind of challenged me to think about, I wonder if there's a way that you can actually use your ventriloquist act uh, to also share a message. And uh, that's when I honed that, well, that's when I began to hone or really think about um, how I might use that as a way to also build a bridge to talking about spiritual things. Wow, so, that's, that's amazing. I love that. So, so how long were you, how long were you in the, in that group until that kind of? Well, I, you know, I was a freshman when I got involved with Campus Crusade, uh, and then I slowly uh, moved up the ranks in student leadership in the organization, in the group, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and um, so all four years of, of college. And then when I graduated college, I actually came on staff with Campus Crusade. I went into the uh, oh. campus ministry and was just your regular Joe campus staff guy. Uh, Kent State University was my first assignment, but I was still doing ventriloquism uh, on the side. It's funny, I, I uh, was telling that story to a friend of mine who's a comedian mm -hmm. and said, you know, I was doing ventriloquism on the side and he stopped me and he said, wait, isn't technically all ventriloquism done on the side? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought, why have I never thought of that before? Yeah, uh, that's great. But um, yeah, then the ventriloquism just started to take over. I got calls from people saying, hey, can you come do an event on our campus? Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to have you, um, you know, do uh, something that's connected with our fundraising event. And, you know, one thing after the other. Uh, now, it was also during college that I landed the job working at Kings Island in Cincinnati. And, oh, wow. Uh, so that was how I think I really honed my crafts, my craft, or at least my skills mm -hmm. uh, as a performer, because you're performing every day. Uh, and I yeah. did six short shows a day, uh, six days a week. <laughs> so wow. you can't help but to get better. And of course, yeah. it's a fresh audience that comes every time uh, mm -hmm. to the show. So, so that was also a big part in uh, helping to form me into um, 
a full-time working performer. So did you have music in your act then, or was mu was music something that you added later on? No, I put it in my act, I okay. uh, even then. Um, uh -huh. You know, music is great because it's a good filler, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't have this, uh, you know, string of funny material, at least you can do something with a song mm -hmm. uh, that kind of fills time. <laughs> and also, yeah. you know, I was working at a theme park. It's, you know, music is kind of expected uh, with that genre. You know what I mean? There's, there's just music that's. Sure very much involved with shows like that, you know, the variety shows. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious, um, I wanna kind of talk about the, the Mac story, but I wanted to ask you, did you have another character that you did his bit with before, before uh -huh. he did, okay. And did you, did you use Buford with that as well? Or was Buford, Buford later on? Buford came along in that era. Uh, I got okay. him, um, talked to Verna about, uh, making Buford for me. So Buford was made by Verna Finley. Mm -hmm. uh, and that connection, of course, was with the ventriloquist convention. Um, so Buford came first and he was kind of the, you know, the opposite. As a ventriloquist, you know, you, you generally are going to use that high nasally voice with your, especially since I was using a very standard ventriloquist character. Um, then it it seemed mm -hmm. natural to have another character where I would use a different vocal range. And so Buford, of course, is more of that dopey uh, Mortimer Snurd voice. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of similar even in personality, though he's a dog. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And so it just seemed natural to have the, the contrast between the two. And then uh, it was about a year later that Aunt Tilly came into this into the act and, oh, wow. Um, and then she's really become the favorite among mm -hmm. most people, certainly among older audiences. I was, I'm in my office here and I mm -hmm. have this picture that this was <laughs> a, a picture oh, wow. that was actually, that was my costume my first year um, working at King's Island. So I don't know how well, you know, it's kind of the reflection. Are you guys, is that matching outfits? It's matching outfits. Now, I didn't actually come up with the matching outfits. That's what King's Island uh, came up with. And yeah. that's pretty much the wardrobe that they gave us. So that was back when I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, that's the Craig Lovick figure. Um, and his name was Otis. That's great. So Wow. So neat. So so they Kings Island found you through. Oh, I audi kind of I auditioned. Oh, you auditioned. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and that was a dream to work at Kings Island. Yeah. Like you know, when I would go there as a kid and I would watch the shows and see the performers, I just thought this would be the coolest place in the world to work. Uh, were you were you kind of worried about like 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 uh, oh if I if I get it am I do I have enough material or have you done enough shows that you were you felt prepared to to take on that responsibility as a performer there. I think I was naive <laughs> yeah. and, and optimistic and- uh, It's a good combo. <laughs> yeah, it, it's what happens. Yeah. And so it developed over time and I was grateful that there were people within the entertainment department that helped me out with things. And of course you're with other performers. I was in the, you know, in the entertainment world there at Kings Island. And so you met other musicians and other people that we would collaborate on material and uh, come up with ideas. So. Wow, I love that. I love that. Um, so, could you talk a little bit about about Mac? Because I've heard the story before, and it's I just I love the I love the story. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll try to. I mean, I feel like there'd probably be a lot of people that have heard the story, and I actually, I actually have put it in video form now. Um, oh, great! But. Um, yeah, was always a huge fan of the McElroy brothers ever mm -hmm. since I went to the museum. Uh, first time I went to the museum, I was 12 years old and uh, of course saw Jocko the monkey and uh, Cecil Wigglenose and as a 12 year old was totally captivated by these highly complex, uh, really amazing uh, characters and puppets. And uh, asked the curator at that time, uh, you know, how do you get a hold of one of these McElroy? Uh, and uh, she yeah. kind of, she kind of reacted just like that and 
and said, well, <laughs> they, don't, they don't make them anymore. Um, they were still alive at that time. But she said, you know, they, they pretty much don't do it anymore. But then they gave me a list of, of the current figure makers. And that's actually how I found Craig Lovick. Oh, wow. And that figure was just simply one that I could afford. And even that barely yeah. <laughs> afford. Uh, at that time, you know, I had to ask family to, you know, help me out uh, mm -hmm. in order to purchase that figure. So that's the backdrop to that story and it it was years and years later that in 2001 that a woman came up to me after I had done a performance at a show or had done a performance at a church I should say mm -hmm. um, told me that her grandfather was a ventriloquist and that she now had the puppet that uh, he used in his act of course I never suspected that what she had would be a McElroy uh, but right. I asked her some questions about it and said, you know, do you know anything about who made this thing? And and she said, well, I think my grandfather might have said that it was made by a couple of brothers. <laughs> and of course, then I was wow, told, really? Yeah. So I, I said, OK, tell me more. Uh, and I asked her, you know, so does this have lots of complex movements on it? Like, does the hair stick up and the the tongue stick out, the ears wiggle? And she said, yeah, he does all that. So then I thought, okay, this has to be a McElroy. Yeah. And then I proceeded to tell her all about the McElroys. And I told her that it was incredibly valuable, that um, you know, there would be collectors out there that would love to you know, have this figure. And I said, I would love to have him, but I'll be honest with you, if I had him, I would perform with him. I would, I would um, put him into my act. That would be a dream come true for me. And uh, so I said, I'd love to see it. And she said, well, come on by tomorrow. And we, I went there the next morning and um, she had him sitting out on the sofa. And of course, when I walked in and saw him, I knew immediately uh, that this was in fact, you know, a McElroy. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and I actually started to cry. <laughs> like I was just so kind of overwhelmed by the moment. Right. Yeah, it sounds like a dream. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then she uh, was, oh, and I had said to her the night before, okay, if what you have is a McElroy, I may very well wet my pants. <laughs> That's what I said to her. And Blimey. so when I reacted the way that I did, she said, so are you going to wet your pants? <laughs> and um, I said, well, you know, thankfully no, but uh, this is really amazing to see this. And and you've taken very good care of it. Your grandfather obviously took very good care of it. It's it's really in one of the best shape. It's it's in the best condition uh, for a McElroy for its age uh, that I've really that I've seen, except for maybe Cecil. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, so she said to me like this was the really amazing moment. She said to me last night as I was driving home, she said, I had a little conversation with God. And she said, God specifically told me that he has been saving this guy for you. <laughs> so I was just, wow. I was just completely choked up. blown away. Yeah. More than choked yeah. up. I think yeah. I, I just, yeah. I, I was quite touched. So I said, well, here's the deal. I would love to pay you for him. Um, and I would love to pay you what he's worth, but I'll be honest with you. I probably can't afford what David Copperfield <laughs> could pay you yeah. or, you know, some other people that were, um, uh, you know, paying top dollar for these, right. but we negotiated a price that was affordable for me and was acceptable for her. And so, uh, but she said really more than anything, I just want you to have him because I know that you are going to carry on my grandfather's legacy, uh, which is why. Even if somebody came up to me and offered me a million dollars for this guy, yeah. I would, you know, I couldn't do it because <clears throat> the gift from the Lord was the opportunity for me to be able to use this guy in performance, which has just been magical. To, and, wow. he, and he's a huge challenge <laughs> to you. Yeah, and you pull it off, I mean, so well. I mean, it's, it's especially with the fact that you have him and then you have Buford. And you're going back and forth and keeping all of that. Um, was the adjustment from now you had you were using your your Lovic figure before him? Is that correct? Yeah. Was the was the transition from the Lovic to to him a challenge? And how did how did that 
<laughs> how did that kind of come well, into play? How much? Of course it was. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It was a challenge. Uh, not the least of which is, you know, the McElroy has the thumb control for the mouth and my low vic is index finger. Uh, oh, wow. So I had to, you know, completely just get used to that. Right. But I was highly motivated. Uh, mm -hmm. And my wife was kind of stunned because she had never really seen me so earnest in practice. Uh, you know, um, prior to that, I would maybe just practice a little bit, you know, kind of work out some new material. I'd practice in the car, <laughs> you know, like just thinking through the material, not so much manipulation and all of that. Sure. Uh, but I was very earnest about uh, getting this down. And it was just fun for me to play with him. <laughs> I was like a kid. Yeah. A kid so. Wow. Yeah. So all of his movements worked in everything? Yes, uh, all except the um, winker which needed a spring. The spring had broken. Oh. But um, with the McElroy's, everything's rods. Yeah. And so uh, if, I, if, if I pulled the lever to make him wink, you know, the winker would stay down. But because it's a rod, you mm -hmm. could push the lever back up and the, uh, and the winker would go back up. So, oh, wow. So technically, it, it still worked. Mm -hmm. it, it, you just you want to fix that so that the lever returns where it's supposed to when using that, you know, you wouldn't want to accidentally push the lever and then he's winking and you don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? So. Right. I completely. Did you ever, uh, did you ever find out what the, uh, the previous owner had like the performance, uh, how, what he used it for? Or oh, oh yeah. I totally, shows or anything? Oh, totally knew that. Um, matter of fact, I've, I've got pictures around here. I could even show you. Um, so the performer was was Wayne Fernelius. Okay. Uh, that was this gal's grandfather. And he did safety programs. And so he used him, and his name was Jerry McSafety. Now, if you go to the ventriloquist, um, if you go to the Bent Haven Museum, you'll see some, there's a couple of pictures in there of Wayne Fernelius with Jerry McSafety. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, hang on, let me see if I can, I think I have it right over here. I'll grab it. Okay. I'll be right there. This oh, is fantastic. So I actually put this notebook together because I took, oh, wow. I took him to the um, Antiques Roadshow. I had the opportunity to go to the Antiques Roadshow and uh, I, I didn't actually end up being one of the featured people on the Antiques Roadshow, but which was fine. It was just a fun experience. Uh, yeah. I'm a big fan of the Antiques Roadshow on PBS. Yeah. Do you even yeah, know? A, it, okay. I do. Yeah, I, I've seen it. Yes. Yeah. It's a, great, it's a great series. So I put together this notebook, um, and that's Wayne and, of course, Jerry McSafety. And I still have the outfit, too. And that's in a plastic bag up here. I, I could show you that. But then I have a few things in here. There are these postcards that, uh, Oops, I'm sorry. It's so I'm so yeah, used. Yeah, we can we Zoom. can see him better now. I'm so used to Zoom where it's a mirror image, and this is like an opposite. Uh -huh. You know. So anyway, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's postcards. Wow, that's great. And um, I've got a couple. This is a really fun story. I learned about this gal. So the the um, daughter of this girl mm -hmm. you know um had this newspaper article and she found me somehow but that's actually how jerry mcsafety was dressed when he came from the brothers which totally makes sense that's definitely an outfit that he would be wearing you know that's how the brothers would have dressed him mm -hmm. uh now wayne fernelius actually put and that's Let's see, that's not Wayne. Yes, it is. He actually put um, this little safety harness thing on him. But other than that, that's how he was dressed. So he obviously dressed him as a policeman mm -hmm. uh, in the future. But there was a contest of 25,000 names for the dummy. Hers was the best. And so this girl right here, and let me see how old she was. 
14 years old, she's the one that came up with the name Jerry McSafety. <laughs> wow. So isn't that a fun little story? And so this newspaper article is dated 1938. And so seeing how he's dressed mm -hmm. and knowing that, you know, this was how he first got his name, uh, I think that's pretty good indication that that would have been the year he was built, 1938. Yeah. So I'm thinking 37 or 38, but it's probably reasonable to, to base it on this art because of this article sure. that he was built in 1938. So. Wow. That, that's amazing. Um, someone, someone commented, uh, who helped you fix Mac and did Mac ever need uh, a repaint or touch-ups? Yes. So initially, um, uh, Ken Groves, I, I called him up and told him about this find and, oh, wow. uh, and Ken and I got together in his shop. Ken is very mechanical. He fixes cars all the time mm -hmm. uh, and is a great friend. And so Ken and I got together and uh, we did some just kind of touch up on the mechanics. Um, the cradle was, a, and okay, so you know what I mean when I say cradle. I do, I'm, you might have to translate that terminology. <laughs> Yeah. So inside the McElroy, in the body, there is a metal holder that actually holds the head in place. And so the cradle was just basically loose. It, it had gotten over the years, it had just gotten sloppy. And so it was just kind of, it needed to be tightened up. And uh, Ken Groves had um, an arc welder and, you know, the capacity to do that kind of work. And so we were able to fix the cradle up. Uh, and then also install the spring for the eyelid and that sort of thing. But then after a couple of years, um, I talked to Ray Gwill, and I always saw Ray as the guy to go to. Uh, Ray is just an amazing artisan, incredible skill as a figure builder, and amazing talent as a painter. Uh, you know, there's good reason that Jimmy Nelson regularly had Danny O'Day in uh, Ray Will's shop um, because Ray was just amazing at, at what he did. And so Ray and I became really close friends. And um, I also need, I knew that because Ray has, a, he's a busy guy, I was a busy guy and uh, had a tendency to take his time, that if I was gonna have him work on Mac, I might need to just kind of stay there until he's done. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I would spend a week, uh, this happened at least twice, where I would spend a, a week with him. And then this way, Ray knew he had a week. <laughs> <laughs> Give him some incentive to get, get cracking. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because he knew that I was going to be leaving in a week mm -hmm. and I had shows to do. And it's not like I had a backup at that point. And I still don't have a backup. Like, you know, it, Mac is it. Uh, wow. So um, that's when uh, Mac really, well, Ray was just really able to, you know, add his magic touch <laughs> to Mac to get him, wow. uh, kind of restore him back to what I would consider to be kind of his original luster. So mm -hmm. the paint job on him was not the original McElroy Brothers paint job. Uh, I knew that almost right away. Uh, so it had been touched up and painted over um, sure. over the years. And so I, I knew that I wanted to get him restored so they would he would look very presentable on stage. So that took some time, but wow. we got him. So when they when uh, when Ray did the the paint touch ups and things, did he take was it a whole the whole re redo of the face? Yeah. Wow. So did he? So he stripped it, or he did you just paint? I guess you would strip it, right? Well, some, or did some he paint? stripping is involved. Mm -hmm. Sanding. There was actually a tiny little hairline crack in his upper lip. Oh. And, and of course, I would sit with Ray when he would work on him, and so Ray would say, "You know, the first thing we need to do is kind of drill this out and then fill it in, so that you know that's repaired." And he's got this little tools, and he's, you know, and I'm just going, oh. 
no, no. Like <laughs> I was yeah. having heart attacks as that was happening. But, you know, I also trusted Ray and, uh, you know, Ray, and it needed to happen. You know, it just needed to be fixed. And so there would be a, a few things like that. And so, sure. yeah, there was some, you know, you'd sand down some things and um, he didn't necessarily strip him completely of the original paint, but you do have to do some sanding and kind of get mm -hmm. it prepared to sure. uh, add the paint on, so. Wow. Wow, that sounds like quite the process. I, I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, you were particularly like this because of course you're a, a puppet builder yourself. So yes. it, it makes sense to me that those would be the questions that you would ask. Yeah, I, I love all the all the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. And yeah. the, uh, the, the, the backstories for everything. Yeah. Um, what would you say your, um, your main audiences that you perform for are? Great, great question. Uh, I would say it's become more Christian audiences, uh, the okay. church, uh, churches. Um, it's not limited to that, but I have found that that has kind of become the niche that mm -hmm. I have just gotten into. A lot of that is because people, when they want me to come do a show, is that they do want me to include uh, where, how I share the gospel. Sure. And so um, that's how that's happened. Wow. And uh, by God's grace, you know, people still call. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's called lately. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm always amazed that I'm still able to continue to work and, and you do you've done uh some cruise line uh work as well yeah well let uh, me explain that a little bit i i i've never auditioned and worked for the cruise line directly cruise lines do charter groups and um that means that there will be people who will come to the cruise line and they'll say we've got 500 people and we basically want to do a conference on your ship and so um naturally a cruise line will be very excited about that. And so what happens is that they schedule times for that group to use the main showroom uh, or specific rooms within the cruise ship sure. uh, for their presentations, for their uh, conference content. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've been brought on with several of these um, Bible teachers like Chuck Swindoll and David Jeremiah, as well as some what would be called full charter groups, uh, working with Bill Gaither, uh, who's in the Southern Gospel world. Uh, and they, when I say full charter, they basically charter the whole ship. Oh, wow. And so they're providing their content. They're providing their entertainment, if you will, mm -hmm. all their content. And so I'm I'm coming on as a part of that team. So I have been hired by the cruise director. Right. I have been, I'm a part of that team where I am now, you know, doing my presentation for the people who have come on this conference uh, to get that content. Does it wow. make sense? Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And it's actually kind of the best of both because I really get to enjoy uh, the cruise that way. And, mm. um, you know, I'm in a regular stateroom. <laughs> for sure, people, sure. And I have what's called passenger status. Uh, and so I can appreciate it. And it's also an audience that is very much invested in what's going on. If you're working for a regular cruise line, you know, people are, they can decide, well, let's see, do we go to the show tonight? I don't know. Let's, let's go do something else, you know. And so right. it can be very fluid. But when you're a part of the conference, basically the people that are there have paid to be in this conference. And so they want to come to everything. Yeah, they're invested. They're totally invested. Mm -hmm. And so the night that I'm doing my show, you know, the full concert, if you will, my full presentation, everyone comes uh, wow. because they're they're invested. And mm -hmm. so that's nice. That's not always the case with uh, variety performers on a cruise ship. So when you're part of this group and they have you perform, is it is it just part of your show, or do you usually do your full show? Is this so I, I part of a larger show? Group? And then okay. uh, usually they ask me to do a couple of teasers or a couple little fun little bits of business 
uh, during a, a couple of the other sessions that helps to build anticipation for you know my my big show, which is often at the end of the week, kind of a big celebration. We're just kind of neat. sets set a time set aside some time to just have fun, kind of thing. Sure. So, so you so you fly all over the world for for these shows. Well, yeah. Yeah. I do. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, do you have any? Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, like flight stories? Because I know. You know, you bring up puppets and flight, and there's always that. Uh, could you share yeah. one with us? Oh, sure. Well, um, you know, when I travel with Mac, uh, his head uh, never is away from me. So his head is in a carry-on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's priceless, and I'm right. certainly not going to include him in the luggage that gets, you know, put through uh, down underneath. But the body uh, is too big to be in a carry-on, of course. And so that does go down under. Um, but as you well know, a body is basically just an empty shell. And frankly, the body that I now use with Mac is, a, um, is not the original McElroy body. Um, I had another body that I made so that you know, I could keep the original in, as, in good condition. Sure, that's a great idea, yeah. So... Um, yeah, there have been a couple of times. There was one time when I was like the last flight out on a Saturday, and it was because I had done a show on the East Coast, and I was flying to the West Coast to do something in Oregon. And I showed up, and the pastor picked me up there, and I was going to be doing a presentation on Sunday morning. And so he, he did not prepare a sermon. I was going to be kind of a featured thing that was happening on Sunday morning, which seems odd that I would yeah. be doing something on a Sunday morning, but it fit in this church. Sure. Uh, you know, they, you know, the congregation was prepared for what that was going to be, that it was going to be something mm -hmm. unique and special. So uh, I showed up, but none of the characters did. Like I had Mac, I had his head, but mm -hmm. that was it. Um, the airline knew where they were. They just got left somewhere, but there was no other flight coming in that night, and the characters would not arrive until one o'clock the next day, which is wow. after church. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at the pastor, and he looked at me, and we just we prayed, and we said, mm -hmm. "Okay, Lord, uh, you know, you have control over this, and um, you knew that this was going to happen." And so we really want to trust you, um, but, you know, please grant us wisdom on how we should handle this. Sure. And so what we decided to do is the next morning I uh, stood up and I gave a little teaser that I could do, you know, the little baby cry routine uh, that I did uh, that I kind of use in the act just to kind of get things rolling. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and he said to the congregation, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to dismiss. And you can come back at two o'clock. And um, David is going to do his whole presentation then. So it kind of sprang that on the congregation. Now I'm thinking, as well as the pastor, okay, people have made plans for the afternoon. They weren't expecting this to happen. Right. Um but what actually happened is that there were more people there at two o'clock in the afternoon than were there in the morning. So there were wow. a people that came that were not there. And so that's where there was very much a sense that, okay, I can see the providence of God in this, that this mm -hmm. was very much like this was God's plan all along. And uh, this was the way that he got that accomplished. Yeah. So, you know, there's nail biting experiences. That that one had, of course, a great ending. Uh, there was also a time when I traveled to Africa and the characters didn't make it. And it's just nail biting. And especially when you're traveling overseas, you're always concerned: are things going to get like lost forever? Uh, mm -hmm. Are you know a suitcase is going to be opened back there and somebody's going to steal it because it looks valuable and so on? Thankfully, I've never lost anything you know, permanently that way. Right. But it always makes you nervous. And I pray, pray, pray really hard <laughs> when that happens. So it definitely drives you to, um, you know, trust God uh, 
in those situations. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I I always love to I always love to hear the the uh, hard figure flight stories because yeah. they're always they're always with the same um, uh, grimace behind them. But it's always it's always interesting to hear what happens. Um, yeah. Scott Santee commented, "Ask Dave about performing in a maximum security prison." Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> it's fun that Scott is on. Thanks for tuning in, Scott Santee. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of stories actually. Uh, I've been in actually now hundreds of prisons that I've had the opportunity to perform in, working with the Behind the Walls Prison Ministry, which was founded by Bill Glass, who was an NFL football player way back in the day, uh, and then became uh, a, basically an evangelist, a speaker, uh, where he would travel around and um, kind of like a Billy Graham, if you will, um, sure. kind of speaker. and then his focus was primarily in prisons and he would gather around him a team of people, a lot of professional athletes or retired professional athletes and then performers like me, where we could go in and um, entertain these guys, which they're desperate for any kind of entertainment, anything that's uplifting and fun. Yeah. Uh, as you can imagine, being in that environment, it's a, something that they would really long for. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then, of course, we also want to deliver the message of the gospel uh, when we do that. So, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of a specific story. Uh, Scott probably has a specific story in mind that I've told him, but that's not coming to my mind right now. <laughs> His son has actually been with me uh, in uh, jail uh, just recently, where his son, Scott Santee's son, came along. And For a show? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and what happens is we bring in a team of people who also are there to watch the show. But then when I'm finished, I kind of turn it over to them where they have the opportunity to interact and visit with the inmates. Oh, great. There was a guy that came up to me uh, who was actually one of those guys, one of the volunteers that, um, that said, uh, you know, it's, it's good to see you again. Do you remember me? And I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you look kind of familiar. Remind me, where did we meet? And he said, well, we met when I was incarcerated. And so then I was, oh, tell me more. And he said, I was locked up in jail. You came and did my show, or you came and did a show. Um, after the show was over, I came up to you and I told you that I really enjoyed the show. And um, at that time, you asked me if I was a Christian. And I told you, yes. And then you asked me, how long have you been a Christian? And I told you about five minutes. Uh, so he had given his life to Christ at that presentation at the show where he was incarcerated. So he said, after I told you that, you told me that someday when I'm out of prison, I should join up and, and come in as a teammate to... Um, be a part of the whole program where I can now share my story with some of these other inmates. And so he said, so you're the reason that I'm here. Uh, and I just thought, okay, I don't even remember that conversation, but <clears throat> that's the kind of amazing things that God does in settings like that. So, yeah. So that's one of my favorite stories because you know, here's a, here's a real example of somebody who was incarcerated. You always hear about people that are like, oh, yeah, jailhouse religion. Of course, they're going to turn to God when they're in jail because they're desperate. But, you know, that's not really going to change their life. I, I can tell you from personal experience that I know, you know, many people that I can point to whose lives have been absolutely transformed as a result of giving their lives to Christ, placing their faith in him and living for him in that environment and then that and sustaining that uh, after they get released. So yeah. it's wow. life changing. Yeah. How did you, how did you get into that that program? Um, a friend of mine who was an, a performer uh, mm -hmm. recommended me and wow. uh, introduced me to Bill Glass and said, you need to get this guy as a part of the team. And at the time, I was rather intimidated because I thought, okay, they're used to, in this 
particular program, they're used to these athletes, professional athletes, retired mm -hmm. athletes. Or, you know, they had the the uh, guys that would come in that would do feats of strength, you know, and like yeah. really tough guys. I'm a guy with puppets. Like, <laughs> how on earth is this going to work? But what we discovered is that they were really longing for something that was fun and that just made them laugh. And so when I do programs in prisons, actually, uh, Mac is dressed up in black and white stripes like he's an inmate. There's also irony to that because he was originally Jerry McSafety, <laughs> a policeman's outfit, and now I'm using him in black and white stripes as a jailbird, you know, character. Yeah. Um, and inmates actually get a kick out of that. I've had several people say, gosh, don't they find that to be disrespectful? But they get it. I mean, they understand yeah. the humor, that, you know, that I'm going for yeah. there. So, in connect. Oh. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, could uh, could we see Mac? Oh yes, of course. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. And then and then while you're getting him out, could you talk a little bit about uh, your process for introdu introducing a new character into your show, or maybe writing for one? Ugh. I always love to hear the different uh, oh, perspectives on this. Yeah, here we go. Well, what's going on? Oh, hey, look, it's Landon Hardy. How are you, Landon? Doing well. How are you, Mac? Good to see you, man. Yeah, you, Good to see you, one too. Of my favorite ventriculists. Oh, ventricle. thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know how to say it. What? You know how to say ventriloquist. All right. You're one of my favorite ventriloquists. Very nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Wow. So, what's going on with you? <laughs> now I'm uh, t talking to interviewing uh, interviewing David, as I could, as you can see. Wow. And uh, we're having a having a good time. Must be kind of desperate to find <laughs> find good people to talk to. Yeah. <laughs> I love those those pearly whites. That's great. Thank you, man. I always loved how the 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 McElroys, they did the teeth where they were curved a little bit. So yeah. when they did the sneer, you you have that. I just yeah, yeah there's beautiful nice. beautiful and... craftsmanship. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, so did you ever? I'm I'm curious. Did you ever um have? Because you know you hear sometimes people talk about you know using hard figures and and typically the McElroys are are have kind of that might have that you know magic stigma. Were you ever? Yeah. Did you ever kind of compete with that, or is it just because the way that your comedy was and the way you perform with them that you? I kind of just embrace it, and, it, and, okay. and I think you know, Landon. Uh, I would. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily expect that you would know like all the elements of my show. Mm -hmm. But um, one of my favorite things that I do in the show is I get uh, a youngster up on stage, seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine years old. So you do you know the bit that I'm talking about? With the yes, movie? I do. Yeah. So, um, you know, that could go in several ways, especially when you got, you know, a guy like this. But mm -hmm. I kind of just embrace it. And Mac actually, you know, the one of the lines is he looks at the guy and, you know, and he says, oh, just do your... Yeah, well, I just look at him like, you're not scared on me, are you? And usually the kid is like, no, 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 I'm not scared. And then, of course, hey, you ever heard of Chucky? <laughs> <laughs> so that always gets a great laugh because, you know, uh, people are just feeling like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you just said that. But uh, right. there's some really fun uh, exchange that happens with youngsters. And, of course, you know, working with kids, mm -hmm. you know, out of the audience, up on stage you know, is a little risky, but I love that. Uh, I love yeah. to do it because you just never know <laughs> what's going to happen. Yeah. There have been a couple of times when I could tell that the kid was just a little bit too intimidated. Uh, mm. And it, it, at least maybe twice where I had to kind of just get out of the bit and actually, and now I've learned to actually get two kids up on stage. Oh, okay. so if one of them gets a little intimidated, I can kind of swap places and the mm -hmm. second kid can do some of the legwork because that bit involves, you know, getting an object out of the audience and, you know, mm -hmm. get up to me and, you know, hold on to it and, you know, that whole thing. Yes. So I oh. guess for those that are watching, I don't know. How many people do we have watching now? Like We've got uh, 34 people. On. Okay. So of the 34 people watching, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bit where Mac has a paper bag that I put on his head and, and he's going to tell this kid what the object is without looking at it. 
And of course, what happens is Mac turns his head around and there's a hole in the bag and he's peeking at the object. And it's just so fun because almost without fail, the kid is trying to hide the object to make sure that Mac can't see it. And then of course, when, when Mac does identify the object, I'm like, that's amazing. And of course the kid's like, no, it's not. And, well, what, aren't you amazed by that? No. Well, why not? Well, he looked through the hole in the bag. You know? <laughs> so, uh, I just, I just love that moment, you know, yeah. everything that happens. And it's just fun for me to get to share that with, with a youngster up on stage. So. Yeah. It's a, it's a great, I I've seen, I've seen that, that bit of your show. Um, and it's, it's great. Why I love too, is that you don't, over uh overuse his specialty uh features in your show they're very um well yeah you, know, you, you use them at the right that. time but you don't you know um, i think it was probably jeff dunham or somebody years and years ago because of course jeff used a mcelroy in, mm -hmm. in fact yes uh, and i think it was him that's and this was before i had one that said you know you can way overdo this and so I think it's best to just, if you have, you know, this special thing that it does, just use it once sure. and, then, and then the gag's over. So um, that's, I, that was a significant thing when I heard him say that. I thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's what I will do. Or that's awesome and i love i love the the white tux it's just and it what's what's great about the white tux too is it makes them stand out in front of any curtain or, or yeah, black. yeah that's exactly right yeah and i typically wear dark colors when i'm on stage and you know a lot sure. of ventriloquists do that do you do that landon do you like are you intentional about what you wear when you're doing your act yeah i kind of go for the the wayland flowers thing where you like we're all black <laughs> yeah. but um yeah i i, I wear like my, my show colors are like red and purple and like black. So I'll do like purple, a purple yeah. button down and like just black slacks and that type yeah. of thing. Nice, nice. And how's work going for yeah. you, by the way? Like, I know you're interviewing me, but I, I'm curious to know. I mean, obviously we're all in COVID-19, so none of us are working. But I mean, in terms of performances and this sort of thing, are, are you, do you feel like that you feel good about stuff that's coming in? Like, what what are you doing now? I yeah, I did. I had, um, back in October, I had done my first, um, what is it, uh, library showcase, and I had booked a bunch of stuff for this summer. Yeah, great. So uh, that was that was fun, and that was a neat, um, hopefully I'll be able to, uh, I'll, I've, I now have those contacts, of course, so to reach yeah. out to them next summer. Yeah, sure. um, again, but it was, it was the getting out there aspect and getting yeah. into reaching new markets and meeting new people that are in, in this uh, showbiz thing, and yeah. it's been a neat opportunity. Um, and I've been building, also building um, some stuff for some people. Yeah, been, you build in between amazing, all that. So you build amazing puppets. I am. So Thank you. Impressed. I am so impressed with the with the stuff that you've built, and I think you have a fantastic presence on stage, and amazing skill as a ventriloquist. It's just delightful to watch you, uh, you know, grow up in, in ventriloquism. And I know that sounds, you know, kind of funny, but I mean, you know, you started young and. When I first mm -hmm. saw you, it was, I don't know how many years ago, but um, yeah. it's just been fun to watch you kind of grow into this. And you're in your early 20s now, right? You're 20. Mm -hmm. I'm 19. No, you're 19. Okay. That's great. Yeah, it's 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 been a lot of fun. It's exciting to have these uh, um, people in the industry that are uh, seasoned like yourself uh, to uh, help me and to uh, introduce me to the this world of entertainment. Um, in our comments, uh, Mark Hellerstein said, hi, Landon and David. Uh, uh, Christy Lynn said, uh, that is my favorite act that I've ever seen. Uh, Janice, uh, Janice McElroy said, hi, from Max Half Brother. <laughs> and uh, uh, Kay Ann Seaton um, said, uh, kids are awesome. And then Chuck Lyons said, David, are you coming to the convention this year? Oh, yes. Uh, and I think somebody else asked that. Uh, uh, I think... Um... Yeah, maybe it was Chuck that would ask that ask that in one of the comments. And yes, I'm planning to come. I'm registered. Mm -hmm. Got my hotel room all booked, and uh, I'm registered, and I'm really looking forward to it. This is one of the times that I'm actually able to come. Uh, years past, I haven't been able to come with regularity. Sure, uh, it tends to be a uh, a time that 
these conferences, these cruise conferences happen, and uh, those are pretty strategic. <laughs> for sure, yeah. And so I, I generally have to miss the convention when I do that. But this year, you know, there's no cruises <laughs> for me anyway. Yeah. Uh, that I'm booked on, and so I'm able to come. And I always love coming to the convention. It's just such a fun community to be connected. Yeah, to. I, I do too. I wasn't able to uh, attend last year, but I hope that they have this year because I'll be there. Um, uh, so I have uh, a few more questions wrapping up. Um, what is uh, your favorite memory of performing? Oh, wow. My favorite memory of performing. Oh, gosh. Go ahead. What? What? Or maybe Max, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, wow. Okay, let me think about that for a minute. Sure. And sure. Actually, there was something that I wanted to ask you about. Okay. <laughs> Not to change the subject. That's but fine. When you were doing your interview with Mark Merchant. Yes. You mentioned something about this lip control challenge thing. Does that sound familiar? Yes. What is that? Tell okay. me. I, I am. So, I've not seen that. Like, I didn't know what he was talking about. So Dennis Daniels uh, has this lip controlled challenge and I actually just submitted a video in today. Um, but uh, you just do a bunch of, uh, you know, P's, M or V, it, uh, you know, P's and V's yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, you can copy the sentence that he uses or whatever. And then you just tag him at it and we all share it together and get to see each other's characters that we use. And, and uh, you know, it's just kind of a fun thing that he had started. So, so um, what's one of the phrases? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I wrote it down right here. Uh, one of the phrases is uh, the boy bananas. And then the other one is my brain is strained from this challenge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What do you find to be the most difficult? Because I'll answer that in a second. And I, and I do, I'll get, try to get back to your question. I, I'm just sure. the subject to maybe let my uh, brain ruminate on that one. Sure, that's fine. But what do you find to be the most difficult for you? Uh, when, as you're performing and, and, uh, working on your lip control technique. <laughs> oh, for, for lip control? Yeah. Well, um, or just in general, but specifically lip control. Oh, well, for me, I feel like when I'm performing, I feel like I, um, my lips are just like flapping in the wind and I, I have this, I'm really worried about it, even though I'm like still in the moment and it's like a. A subconscious thing but that I also kind of focus on sometimes and then I have to go back because I record everything um and I I see that I I'm fine but I'm always I'm always worried about it because I always I always practice so hard on that and uh, that was like the first thing I learned in ventriloquism is you learn lip control and then you learn um you know where to get your heart figure <laughs> and then yeah, and then it's you. like how to be funny is, <laughs> is kind of the, the path so um yeah, I'm, I'm always I'm always worried about lip control, especially like because I do, you know, I'll do any, any type of show I can I can I can get basically. And I've done like uh, church events and and banquets. And then I've done like kids shows and kids will call you out if you're a if you're a bad ventriloquist. And if you're, you know, so you and they I did a uh, I did a show not too long ago where they had the, the group of kids had seen a ventriloquist at their camp. So they already had expectations going into this. And I arrived and they're asking me stuff like, do you use the drawing board? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I had to make some adjustments to my act. <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah. Do you do any musical elements in your show? Do you do like songs or? I do. I do. I have, um, I have a few songs. I do a, um, I introduced the vet mask because that's, I, I feel like everyone does that. And so I thought I'd, I'd add that too. And people love sure. it because you get to, it's kind of like having an inside joke with the crowd because you've got the, the, uh, the crowd member up there with you. And um, so I, I do, I do a song to that. And I do, I have one of my, I have my older character, Mervin. He, um, he sings the ring of fire. Oh, nice. And yeah. uh, I have, I do that for my senior and um, women's luncheons and things like that. Got it. Oh, um, I have, I have him in that, that bit. That's so great. it works out well. Yeah. And then I've, I've got, that's um right after, right before he does his whole, his whole bit where he's trying to um, appeal to the women in the crowd. And so he gets out his uh, dentures and his toupee. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite, quite prop heavy, but it's, uh, 
That's great. It's fun. Yeah, I'm, 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 I enjoy the uh, the creative process and, and adding new bits to it. So. Okay, so to answer my own question about the uh, what's the most difficult in terms of lip technique, uh, mm. when people ask me that question, what I've basically come up with it that I think is the hardest thing to do is anytime that there is an um, a difficult letter that is combined with R, like for example, French fry, anything with R or or even the BR sound or the PR sound, like all you know, there's the there's the um, you know, the B's and P's, you know, we all know that. Sure. But then, you know, kind of once you get that down, that's one level. But then when you add the R, you know, brown, uh, then that to me makes it much more tricky. And I, I was just wondering if you found that to be the case. That's exactly, you know, I, I, I didn't think about that when you would ask me that question, but I can totally relate to that statement. Yeah. I'm curious, do you do you do the letter substitution or have you found your own way around that or? No, I, I pretty much do the letter substitution. Okay. So, so you know, but I think uh, it's just, it, it has to do with how you're um, using your tongue on your hard palate to, you know, mm. create that, that plosive sound. And sure. So, yeah. Sure. Well, do you have, an, uh, were you able to think of a, a fun, uh, maybe a fun performance or something where you, it, something stuck out and it made it memorable for you? Uh, well, I, I've had the opportunity to perform, like I said before, in prison. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, you go into a situation like that or a setting like that, and you're hoping to be a blessing to these people. And sure. of course, what happens is that you're the one that is really blessed uh, in that situation. I actually performed on death row and that was an incredibly intimidating situation uh, because, you know, you hear all kinds of stories and, you know, these are people, every single one of them there are guilty of murder. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times on death row, they won't actually let them all be together in one place to see a person. Mm -hmm. They consider that to be too high a risk. Uh, and um, they just don't want to deal with that. But this was a death row in Texas, and they actually brought them out. I'm trying to think how many. There was probably about 20 guys that were all in the room. And um, so I did my show. They laughed. You know, you really have to think through even, like, jokes with Aunt Tilly, this sort of thing. I'm thinking through all the references in my act or any jokes that might have any reference to death. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, you're doing some editing in, the, in your head. When you're in an environment where you think, "Oh yeah, I probably shouldn't do that here," <laughs> you right? Know? Um, but when I was done, there was a group of guys. I think about six guys that said, "Now we've prepared something for you," and they did a gospel song in six-part harmony. Wow! That they sang, and it was just not just to me; it was to the other volunteers that had come in with us. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, okay, my life is so incredibly rich that I get to experience things like this. Um, you know, I don't know very many people who have ever been on death row. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's number one. And then number two, to have had this uh, situation where here's a group of guys that are probably in the worst place you could possibly be in the world. Uh, you know, arguably. Right. And um, and yet there, this particular group of guys uh, were thoughtful enough to actually put something together and to do a, a gospel song. Uh, and it was like an old spiritual, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some someday when I cross over, I don't remember the song, but it's mm -hmm. you know, someday when we cross over that, uh, the river and we, mm -hmm. and we get to the other side, it's that kind of spiritual. Uh, and of course, it was just so moving. And I sat there thinking, okay, I am I am so fortunate and blessed to to get to do what I do. Yeah. Um, and to have the opportunity to be in this kind of environment, you know, which is such a paradox because one would think, okay, who on earth wants to actually on purpose go to that situation? But it was unbelievable just what a blessing that was. So that comes to my mind when you ask me that question. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, it's always great when you feel like the audience is just totally with you and mm -hmm. that's exciting and, yeah. you know, feels very affirming. Yeah, I think the moment energy, I think it was Jeff Galtz that, you know, made the comment among, you know, the two and a half hours <laughs> <laughs> that interview with you uh, where, I mean, I listened to some of it and watched it. It was fun to see Jeff. You know, I, Jeff is in my city. He lives in Indianapolis, but I never oh. see him. And we have talked about how we live in the same city. We should, you know, uh, I should get together or something. I, and I, I was reminded mm -hmm. that, you know, that's just, we've never really done that. And Jeff is a yeah. club performer. You know, the comedy club is not my scene. <laughs> uh, um, right. Well, it's a little different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. I've been in a couple comedy clubs. They're a challenge for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, say it's bad or whatever. I'm just saying it's not my. No, no, it's just a different, <laughs> yeah, different totally. beat to it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, Jeff said something about, uh, and when he did his performance, he got addicted, you know, the, that he took the, mm -hmm. drug. you know, he was using that as a metaphor. Right. And that does happen. You know, when you're a performer and, and you're on stage, there is something that's, uh, that's very special about, you know, the audience response. And mm -hmm. this is where too, I have, just like most performers, there's always situations where, you know, you think you're flying high, but then you just bomb on stage and that brings you back to, brings you back to earth, right. <laughs> you know, when you yeah. realize that, uh, okay, um, you know, we're capable of, of bombing and, um, it's exciting when there's a great show, but then you just never know. It, it yeah. could go. <laughs> it could well, there's, there's a plethora of elements that go into making the perfect show or breaking it. Yeah. And so, you know, any, any one thing out of line could just, yeah. Yeah. Um, could you, to uh, maybe the newbie event watching or sure. someone that uh, maybe needs coaching on their writing, could you share kind of your advice for writing for a character? Or maybe kind of a foundation on, on where to start? <laughs> I'm the one that needs coaching in my writing. Um, so I, there's lots of elements that, that go into humor writing and mm -hmm. there's lots of great books that are out there. Um, okay. So now I'm trying to call up one, uh, any, uh, let's see. Huh, wow. So basically you have to get to it. You, mm -hmm. The, the main thing, and I'm sure Landon, you know, you're very aware of this, is that when you write, it's fine if you write something that is incredibly wordy, but then you have to have the discipline to start taking out what's not, what is not necessary. And you have yeah. to get to the funny. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's a challenge for me because I can tend to be verbose on stage and I kind of like long setups. To me, that's kind of just fun. Uh, but the key to good comedy writing is honing your setup and then getting to the punchline as quickly as you can, as, as elegantly as you can, meaning mm -hmm. with, with no, you got to trim out all the fat. Sure. So in terms of practical advice, I would say, um, find people that are good at it and then befriend them. There's a buddy of mine, his name's John Branion, who's a brilliant comedy writer. And John will tell you, because people have said, how did, how did you and David Pendleton meet? And he, John will tell you, it's because David came up to me and he said, will you be my friend? <laughs> I hope that it didn't sound that desperate. But the point <laughs> is, <laughs> the point is um, there are some people that are just really, really talented at joke writing and comedy writing, and there's a lot, there's a lot to be learned uh, from people like that. I frankly don't consider myself to be one of those people. That's what I'm telling you. Okay. Um, I consider myself to be more of a technician mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, I do feel like that I have fairly decent skills as a ventriloquist sure. uh, in terms of. Um, voicing and, you know, speaking without moving my lips, you know, that those kinds of skills, as well as puppetry and, you know, everything that's involved with 
uh, creating a character that is believable on stage. But I do like how you talk about the importance of having someone to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because yeah. that's, yeah, it's part of the writing process. And, and um, you know, sometimes, you know, I've, I've had instances where I'll, I'll, I'll be thinking one way and then, you know, someone I'm talking to will say, well, what if you did, what if you took that and then moved it here? Or what if you said this, this with it? Or what if just totally delete that, put this yeah. in there? And like, oh, yeah, that, that works. Yeah. So yeah, there's well, a, uh, Jeff a Dunn said a couple of years ago at the convention, he was talking about comedy writing and he, and what he said was absolutely true that as ventriloquists, we're not, we're not typically writing the same way as a stand up comedian is going to write where it's going to be where, where we're talking about ourselves and we are mm. doing the traditional uh, setup punch tag, 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 you know, that's pretty much right. Uh, the, the flow or the format of a stand up mm -hmm. comedian. Uh, for us, we're more of a sitcom because it's characters and it's conversation mm -hmm. and you're there's setting conflict. Up, there's conflict that you're trying to create. Yes. Uh, and so you have to think of it in those terms. It can make it a challenge, actually, if you go to stand up comedians, which, you know, John Branion is a stand up comedian. Uh, Robert G. Lee is a stand up comedian. Most of the funny guys that I go to uh, that I look to for mm -hmm. help have to also shift in their own mind that, oh yeah, we're not writing for a stand-up comedy act, but right. what we're writing for is more like um, a sitcom. Uh, mm -hmm. It's dialogue based. Sure. And so I thought that was profound in, in a very uh, simple way of putting it when Jeff said, you know, we're, we, we actually have the opportunity to do a sitcom on stage Sure. that stand-up comedians basically don't do and don't have that uh, advantage. Yeah, that's a that's a great quote. Um, so in uh, in wrapping up, um, what do you hope to see from the future of ventriloquism and from future events? Um, I actually am a big fan of classic ventriloquism. OK. Uh, and you can tell when you see my act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks like something from the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> Um, some people, they roll their eyes at that, but I mm -hmm. think the whole generation of people who they're basically unexposed <laughs> to that. And, um, so I actually would like to see more traditional ventriloquists. I know that's crazy because, you know, everybody else is talking about, oh, we need to be more fresh and original. And right. of, course, we, of course that is true. I'm not denying that. I'm not saying that. You know, we should just all go out and do, you know, <laughs> a bunch of old, stale material. Mm -hmm. But I guess I I really still enjoy a good classic um, uh, style. Uh, you know, Bob Newhart. Sure. His, his style never got old. And he was brilliant as, mm -hmm. as a comic. You know, he wasn't so much a stand-up comedian as he was a comic. He had great comic bits that he did. His his um, his stuff that he did as a solo on stage where, you know, it was him on the phone. And you didn't hear who was on the other end. But, you know, you could tell what they were saying by the way he was responding. And he kind of had that halting way of speaking. I just, mm -hmm. that's just great classic stuff. And um, comedians nowadays feels like that they're trying to be so avant-garde. Sure. <laughs> uh, I just, I would like to see more ventriloquists actually do, you know, of course, original and fresh, mm -hmm. but in, in, in a way that... Performed in a classic style. Yeah, that there's just, mm. I want to see more classic ventriloquists. And I think a lot of times they give in to the pressure from other like from stand-up comedians who kind of roll their eyes and they're like, oh yeah, that's just, that's so, that's so old school. Right. But I think other comedians are saying that, but I don't think audiences are saying that. I, the response that I get from audiences is, this is so refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, and I totally recognize that what I'm doing is a, is a very classic ventriloquist act. 
I'm not trying to be, you know, the stand up comedy guy. Right. I'm actually doing a ventriloquist act. And um, I like to see that. So I love that. That's great. <laughs> That's I just I I love that so much. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but I just, you know, all like Sammy King, you know, I hear I hear you refer to Sammy King. I mean, good grief. That was a that was a ventriloquist act. That was a mm -hmm. profoundly funny and you know, his his best act was what, 12 minutes long. Yeah. And he did it for years and years in Las Vegas and it never got old. So I kind of look to that as it gives me hope. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's great. So if, if uh, people want to find out more about you, where can they go? Um, if they, oh, if they want to find out more about me, yes. why do they want to find out more about me? Well, my website is anythingcantalk.com. Fantastic. And, and I've been around thankfully long enough uh, and got, you know, on the internet early enough that if you just Google David Pendleton ventriloquist, uh, then, you know, you'll see stuff that will pop up. But my website is near the top when you do that. And uh, you'll also see some YouTube videos from my performances. And uh, I have an old that's, that's like way dated now. Um, it's like over 15 years old. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I need to I need to produce something else now <laughs> that can replace that. But uh, that's on my website if you're interested. So. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, David Pendleton, thank you. And Mac, um, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Landon. Landon. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this interview. <laughs> We're it's big fantastic. fans of you, Landon. Oh, well, been... thank you. I'm, and I yours. You guys are absolutely amazing. And to all the rest of your cast, uh, David. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank them as well um, for everything they contribute to their show. And thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, this was a great interview, and I'll also upload this on uh, on YouTube. And so we'll, it'll always be there. Awesome. Thank you guys so much, and take care. Good bye. Bye. You, Brandon. Bye.